my name is Dr Janice Orr. I'm a lecturer in optometry and an optometrist at Aston University. In order to focus the slit lamp, you need to use a focusing rod. What you're doing is you are narrowing the slit and you would focus each eye independently. So you would start from most plus and rotate the eyepiece until it first comes into focus and then do the same for your left eye. When each eye is focused independently, you would then adjust the width of the eyepieces to, in order to match your interpupillary distance. The alternative to using the focusing rod is the parallax method and essentially what you do is use the bridge of the nose as an alternative to the focusing rod. You use the parallax method by rotating the illumination system side to side till it appears not to move. If you keep going towards the nose, you'll eventually get a whiff movement. You've gone too far if you get a whiff movement. You would then move back again until you see no movement at all. And that is the distance at which you would focus the slit lamp on the bridge of the nose. The alternative is to use the closed eyelid. Either of these are alternatives to the focusing rod. The focusing rod is preferred though because then you're not making any assumptions about distance. So in order to place your patient at the slit lamp you must make sure the table is at the correct height. Ask your patient then to come forward and place their chin on the rest. There is a canthus marker on the side and you must make sure that the canthus marker lines up with the outer canthus. Does that feel comfortable or would you like the table down slightly? No, that's fine. So in order to look at the external eye and adnexa, diffuse illumination is the best technique to get a general overview of the eye. In order to do this, you should use a diffuser if you have one. This spreads the light evenly and means you can look at the whole eye in general as opposed to through the slit on its own. Widen the beam to maximum and make sure you have sufficient illumination to illuminate the full eye area. Then you would have a general look at the lids and the lashes and looking at the bulbar conjunctiva and cornea from a more general perspective. When you've completed a diffuse examination, you would then remove the diffuser and you would narrow the beam and decrease the brightness slightly still keeping your magnification low, um, about 10 to 16 times, and you would do what we call a parallel piped section. And this allows you to look at the layers of the cornea in a more general way. So you would be able to see each structure, but not in as much detail as you would with optic section. If you want to have a more detailed view of any area of the cornea, you would narrow the beam further and increase the magnification to 16 times or even 25 times. This is not suitable to look at the whole cornea as it would take much, much longer. So you're best to look with a parallel piped section and then increase the magnification and narrow the beam so you can look at the area in question in more detail. In order to look at the cornea, you would start looking using a parallel piped section, which is your wide beam, two to three millimetres beam with low magnification. If you then wanted to look more closely at the cornea, it would be useful to do sclerotic scatter. And this is using a narrow beam with low magnification, with the beam placed exactly at the edge of the limbus at the start of the cornea. And what we'd expect in a normal cornea is for total internal reflection to occur throughout the cornea and for light only to escape through the limbus and the nasal side. So you should get an even glow around the limbus. However, if there's anything within the cornea to disturb the light, you will get scatter. So if there is edema, for example, or scarring within the cornea, the path of the total internal reflection will be interrupted and you will have light scatter in that area of the cornea. If you do sclerotic scatter first, 
then you'll be able to locate certain areas of the cornea that you want to concentrate on for optic section. And then you would narrow your beam and increase your magnification to allow you to look at the area in question in more detail. When performing sclerotic scatter, you have to have the beam at the limbus exactly, and you have to have a narrow beam. In order to actually view the cornea, you can look with your naked eye. However, you are best to decouple the observation and illumination system, which is done using the control here, and you can then rotate the illumination system so that the observation system is not along the same plane, and you will be able to then use the oculars to view the cornea. So specular reflection is a technique that allows you to view the endothelium within the cornea and the anterior crystalline lens surface. Essentially, you're starting with an optic section with a narrow beam and you're essentially having your illumination system and viewing system separated by 25 to 35 degrees. You first find your first Purkinje image, which is a very bright image, also known as the corneal reflex. And then essentially what you're doing is rotating the illumination system round until you're then viewing the correct area. You're actually viewing the Purkinje image through the oculars of the slit lamp. And then you increase your magnification. So I would go up to 25 times and make sure then that you still have your first Purkinje image. You might have to relocate that and make sure that you have your first Purkinje image. And then also you should be looking for your second Purkinje image, which is the duller one to the, the side of the first Purkinje image. And it is your second to the duller Purkinje image that you're looking at that is showing you the endothelium or the anterior surface of the crystalline lens. Again, 25 times magnification is not quite high enough to see the endothelial surface, so you would then increase the magnification to 40 times. Again, it's very easy to lose your place on the cornea when you increase the magnification, which is why I recommend focusing again and locating the first Purkinje image between each step and at 40 times looking through the oculars and making sure that you are viewing the Purkinje images. The first Purkinje image is the very bright one and the second Purkinje image, which is the one of interest, is to the side of that. It looks like orange peel or battered gold and that is essentially what you're looking at to look at the endothelial cells. And you're looking for abnormalities in shape and numbers of cells within in the sample of the endothelium that you have. Obviously you're looking one part at a time and you would use other techniques to locate areas of abnormality and you would tend to focus in on areas in question.